This is the GMK Tech Nutbox 5, one of the coolest mini PCs from last year. It has remained one of my favourite devices for retro gaming and basic home use over the time that I've had it. In this video, I'm going to show you what's so great about this device and how I turned it into the ultimate gaming and productivity hybrid mini powerhouse. Let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Retro Breeze. Here's the Nuckbox 5, a 2022 mini PC from GMK Tech. This mini PC is a full desktop computer which ships with Windows 11. Its tech specs are as follows. A 2.9 GHz Intel Celeron N5105 processor with integrated Intel UHD graphics, which allows you to use dual 4K monitors. 8 GB of LPDDR4X RAM, up to 512GB SSD storage, although I just went with the 128GB version, and Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 on board. It will set you back as little as $150 when you purchase it directly from the manufacturer and use a coupon. And as you'll soon see, this is incredibly good value for what you get. I should mention, by the way, this video isn't sponsored by anybody. It's my product that I purchased myself. Now, the Nutbox 5 is not a powerhouse of a device by any means, although it's really not supposed to be. What you're getting here is one of the most compact x86 based desktop computers ever made. And in order to achieve this tiny size, there have been a few concessions in terms of performance. That said, the Nutbox 5 is absolutely no slouch when it comes to emulation. This thing won't break a sweat playing your favourite games all the way up to N64, Saturn, Dreamcast, and PSP. Upscaled PSP just looks awesome on the big screen, and even the most notoriously heavy titles like God of War and Outrun play perfectly with 1080p upscaling. And even with all of that, this mini PC is not yet done. For nearly all GameCube games will play at full speed too. Even with upscaling to 720p or in some cases 1080p, this thing constantly delivers really good GameCube performance. And even when it comes to PlayStation 2, the Nutbox 5 delivers some very surprising performance, but we'll take a little more in-depth look at emulation a little bit later on in the video. In general though, the Nutbox 5 has just the right level of performance to be absolutely great for day-to-day -day family computer tasks, like web browsing, document editing, media playback, and video calling, whilst also delivering a really solid retro gaming experience as well. And it does all of this at ultra low power, just 6 watts at idle and 18 watts at maximum load. This really makes it the ideal mini PC system. It sips power, stays quiet and cool and out of the way, and performs pretty admirably. Oh, and check out the I.O. they squeezed into this. This thing has all the USB ports you need, two HDMI outs, even wired Ethernet. And to top it all off, it powers up with a USB-C cable, which is just super convenient. There's also some great BIOS features built in, including the ability to automatically boot from an inserted SD card, if that SD card has a bootable image on it. Without an SD card inserted, it boots from the internal SSD instead. This means that we have a very, very user-friendly way to dual boot operating systems. And that gave me a fun idea. I decided to make the Nutbox 5 the ultimate mini PC kiosk for general home use and retro gaming. I want anybody to be able to sit down at the thing and get work done, or play some games. I like to think of it as a guest room computer. Somebody comes to stay, they get a little PC for use while they're here. I know, I know. In 2023, that probably wouldn't be necessary. But hey, this is Retro Breeze. We are forever stuck comfortably in the past. As I said earlier, the Nutbox 5 ships with Windows 11, which in my opinion is not particularly suitable for the hardware. Windows is bloated, clunky, and generally unusable. And on Windows, I found that the Nutbox 5 becomes very bogged down very quickly. You'll be fooled by the decent performance on the desktop, but everything else just grinds to a halt as soon as you have a couple tabs open. Also, the idle RAM use here on Windows is 3.7 gigs which is close to half of the available RAM on the system. So in order for my guests to get the most out of the Nutbox 5, I installed a very user-friendly Linux OS called Zorin on the internal drive. Zorin positions itself directly as an alternative to Windows and Mac, and it works pretty well for that purpose. It is incredibly simple and easy to use with a familiar start menu setup, and it comes pre-installed with some very useful apps like an Office Suite, an Image Editor, and more. A lighter Linux-based OS like this really, really boosts the performance of this tiny system, especially when you start to load up on browser tabs or perform heavier tasks. Now, Zorin OS isn't particularly my first choice for a Linux distro. In fact, I probably wouldn't use it myself because I use Arch, by the way. However, it is a really good option for somebody who's less familiar with computers or Linux in general. It's pretty much the perfect choice for a beginner just starting out with Linux, 
or as a basic, easy to use and snappy operating system for my guest room PC. On the other hand, I've also got a basic 128GB SD card, and I've installed a bootable Linux OS called Badacera. Badacera is a lightweight, gaming-only operating system that can run on basically anything, and our x86-based Nuckbox 5 with its Intel Celeron N5105 processor is a perfect fit. Badacera uses a simple front end called Emulation Station, along with automatically configured RetroArch and standalone emulators. From a basic user's perspective, all they need to do is power on the computer with the SD card inserted, choose a game, and play. There's no messing around with boot menus, no trying to find the right programs to run, nothing like that. So the final setup is going to look like this. Without the SD card, the computer will boot to Zorin for productivity tasks, and with the SD card inserted, it will boot straight into Badacera. And I'm going to set all of this up directly from the Nutbox itself. That's right, I'm going to use the Windows to destroy the Windows. So here we are on the Nutbox 5's Windows 11 desktop. And the first thing I'm going to do is to download Rufus, a simple tool for writing images to USB sticks and SD cards. Now I'll download the images for both operating systems. First Badacera from the official website, the x86 underscore 64 version, and then I'll download the free core version, but not the light version, of Zorin OS. The core version comes with that really useful productivity software built in, whereas the light version's more bare bones. Now I'll write Badacera onto the SD card using Rufus. With the SD card and the computer, I'll open Rufus, select the Badacera image.gz file, ensure the SD card is selected, and click start. This will just take a minute or two, and then Badacera is ready. All I need to do is reboot my computer with the SD card inserted, and bam. It really is that simple. Now there is some configuration I can do to Badacera to get it running perfectly and looking exactly how I want it to, but I'll do that a bit later. For now I'll just shut down, remove the card, and boot up again to re-enter Windows. This time with the USB stick inserted, I open Rufus again and use it to write the Zorin ISO. This time when I reboot, the Nutbox will automatically detect the bootable USB stick and boot from it, just like it did with the SD card. The left option on the setup will let me go into demo mode. This mode is pretty slow because everything is done directly on or from the USB stick, but it does give you a genuine look at the OS and all of its capabilities. You can see here that we have a familiar Windows-like interface, complete with Solitaire built in. I mean, if Solitaire doesn't make this the perfect guest room PC, I don't know what would. Anyway, there's an image editor, document editors, Firefox browser, and a handful of other practical apps. I'm really happy with this, so I'm going to use the icon on the desktop to install it fully. I'll connect to Wi-Fi and agree to install third-party drivers and codecs, which will give me the best performance. And I'll also opt out of the census, which is anonymous telemetry. I don't like telemetry, in case you didn't know. Interestingly, you can actually install Zorin alongside Windows for dual boot capability if you want. I do not want, so I'll choose to erase the entire disk and install Zorin to the whole thing. This will just take a few minutes. And after a quick reboot, I'm in the full version of Zorin. First of all, there's a nice tour that will show me what's available, for example, Zorin Appearance, which lets you change the layouts and the themes and the appearance. As you can see, in true Linux form, you can really customize this to your liking, but it really remains very simple to use. This distro comes with a nice selection of inbuilt apps, but if necessary, I or my guests can get more from the inbuilt software store. Just open it up and find what you want. Adobe Reader for PDFs? It's in here. VPN Client? It's in here too. And all it takes is just a simple click to install anything. It really is super intuitive and very user friendly. Also, when we're at idle, we're sitting at just 2.3 gigs of RAM use. This is a whole gigabyte and a half less than what it was idle in Windows. This means you're going to be able to open heavier applications, you're going to be able to have more open tabs. It's just better overall. And even this is on the higher end for Linux, honestly. If you went for a lighter distribution, you could get this down way more. Also, check out the sending value here. Constantly zero bytes. That means that this operating system is not phoning home, it's not sending any data over the internet if I don't want it to. Perfect. In terms of performance now, web browsing does absolutely great, even with many tabs open. And 4K video playback is perfect as well. You'll probably drop a handful of frames right at the beginning of a stream from YouTube, but after that, you'll get solid 4K performance. This setup also does really well with video streams and calling. In fact, I recently appeared on the Retro Handhelds podcast, and during that podcast, I was using the Nutbox 5. It had absolutely no problem being a part of a five-person video call and live stream all at once. No lagging, no slowdown, no overheating, nothing. I had absolutely no issues at all, and the Nutbox 5 kept up perfectly. Funnily enough, I had actually emergency switched to the Nutbox 5 right before the stream. And that's because with my laptop, even with it all plugged in and charging, 
The battery was draining noticeably while I was on the stream, and we were setting up. I knew that this battery was not going to last for the whole stream, so I quickly shut down, I grabbed the nut box, hooked it up, and I had absolutely no problems with it. It was a godsend in that situation, and I really, really see the value of one of these tiny PCs that you can just throw together in a second. So all that said, the Nutbox 5 is also an excellent solution for video calls, which in 2023 is a very, very important feature. So anyway, that's it for the Zorin side of things, and I'm extremely happy with it. I might add some desktop icons or some widgets or something like that just to be fancy, but for the most part, the stock experience is just really, really great for my kiosk-like use case. So now it's time to do a little bit of configuration on Batacera. And of course, we need some ROMs, BIOS, and box art too. To do this simply, I'm taking the USB stick I used to install Zorin, I'll format it using the Zorin file manager, and then I'll add my own content to it after that. All I need to do now is reboot the PC with the SD card inserted. Now this won't try and boot from the USB stick because there's no bootable image on it anymore. Once Batacera is up, I'll press F1 on the home screen and it will bring up the file manager. Now I can just copy all of my games, all my BIOS and everything across. Now I could also do this over the network after connecting Batacera to it instead, but for now I think this is fine. Now I'll finally connect to the Wi-Fi, make sure the OS is up to date, and then I'll change around the settings and some themes just to set the experience up the way I like it. Now I did do a bit of experimenting with emulators to get the best performance I could, and the best thing about all of this is that you can do it all from Batacera. You don't need to go into RetroArch or any other configuration or edit any files or anything. There's just a very convenient menu where you can change settings per system. So if I want to use a different Dreamcast emulator, I can just do it from this menu. Anyway, I ended up going with this minimal theme because I thought it was really easy to use. And I really like this cheesy lake wallpaper as well. In fact, I actually went back and then applied the same wallpaper in Zorin just to make it a bit more consistent. The last thing I did was use the inbuilt scraper to download box art from my games. And the last thing to do was to simply connect to a wireless gamepad, map it correctly, and then test out some games and performance. So let's go ahead and take a look at some emulation. I'll breeze over the basics here. All 2D systems from Game Boy, NES, all the way up to Super Nintendo, Arcade, and Neo Geo run absolutely flawless. Even Yoshi's Island, which often struggles on low-end devices, had absolutely no problem keeping up at full speed. For 2D systems, you're set with the Nutbox 5, it's perfect. All PS1 games will also run at full speed without exception too. You can upscale most of them to 1080p with no problems at all. Although personally, I kind of prefer the unscaled chunky look. But regardless of how you like PS1 to look, it's 100% playable. And it's more or less the same story with Sega Saturn. Everything runs great at full speed and looks absolutely fantastic. I always like to test Sega Touring Car Championship because it has to run at absolutely full speed without exception to be at all playable. And here it is, running at full speed. Hey, I'm saying that it plays well, not that I play it well. This game's impossible. Saturn is one of those systems I don't even bother upscaling because it looks great as it is. Dreamcast performs very well across the board as well, with 720p upscaling possible in pretty much every single game and 1080p in some of them too. However, there are a few different emulators available with varying performance per game, and some games like Sonic Adventure just have a little slowdown here and there, but nothing game-breaking at all. With some tweaking, I could probably make the performance even better. But for the most part, even the defaults are fine. Just look at how glorious Soul Calibur looks here, running in 1080p at full speed. No slowdown at all. PSP is absolutely incredible on the Nutbox 5. God of War Chains of Olympus runs at a solid 60fps without a hitch, even when upscaled to 1080p. This really looks like a PS2 game now in my opinion, and it indicates that basically every other PSP game is going to do the same. The performance here is absolutely stellar, and PSP games look fantastic upscaled to 1080p on the big screen. Now it's onto the big one, Nintendo GameCube, and performance is, in short, really really good. In fact, way better than I thought it would be. Most games that I've tried will run absolutely flawless at a 720p upscale. This includes Super Smash Bros. Melee, arguably the flagship title, and Shadow the Hedgehog, which often suffers from slowdown on the first stage, runs perfectly as well. GameCube is more or less like this across the board, making the Nutbox 5 a really excellent mini GameCube in its own right. Star Fox Assault remains one of the best looking games on the system, and the Nutbox 5 allows for plenty of upscaling without any performance hits. And when it comes to PlayStation 2, I've been really, really surprised, because there actually seems to be a fair selection of PS2 games that run pretty well, including the classic FPS Black. As you can see, it's not perfect by any means, but it's definitely playable. In fact, I ended up going through the whole first level just because it was fun. I always think that's a good indication of whether a system's good or not for a certain purpose. If it's good enough that you like play through a whole level or two, then it's kind of okay. 
But regardless of that, lighter games like Bionicle, a real childhood game for me, run at no issues whatsoever full speed, even when upscaled to 1080p. Final Fantasy X is another one, full speed at 1080p. Yes, 1080p, that's crazy. And like Dreamcast, I think I could probably tweak a few more settings per game and improve a lot of this a bit further. Oh, and Kingdom Hearts seems to be really good too. But I just ran out of steam on this intro as I always do. I've done it too many times, I can't do it anymore. And so that covers pretty much everything in terms of emulation on this thing. Overall, I've been extremely impressed with it. Not only do you not have to worry about the low end at all up to about Dreamcast, but even beyond that, you'll probably be able to find and curate some games from GameCube and PS2 that run perfect on this system. And I don't know, just the fact that Black was running at such a good speed and perfectly playable just blew me away, honestly. I'm really curious as to what other games I could find on PS2 that will run on this. And so that's my theoretical, ultra-compact, guest room productivity and entertainment PC, based on my favourite mini PC, the GMK Tech Knock Box 5. I really cannot stress just how much I love this little thing. With such a tiny size, like the size of an apple or some Kerrygold butter or something like that, it can still realistically take care of all of my daily computing tasks. And it can also play a huge selection of retro games from NES, all the way up to and including GameCube and some PS2. This technology just blows my mind, honestly. This is the kind of thing that makes me love technology and the possibilities when it comes to retro gaming. And the most exciting thing about the Knockbox 5 is that it's already a year old. So there's even better technology out there already. Even better mini PCs than this, although I don't think any of them are quite as small. Anyway, if you want to grab a Knockbox 5 yourself, I've left links in the description where you can buy it directly from GMK Tech themselves for the best price, or from droix.co.uk if you prefer a reseller with excellent customer support. Again, I'll mention, this video isn't sponsored by either of them. It's my product, my video, my opinions. And that's it for this one. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and leave a like on it, and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. I love to cover tech, retro gaming, and all that kind of stuff, and I also love to do tutorials. Please let me know if you're interested in a tutorial for setting up Batacera or Linux as a primary operating system. If there's interest, I'll definitely do that. Also, let me know in the comment box below what you would do with a mini PC like this. There are just so many possibilities. Maybe a lab, maybe a home server. Really, the list goes on and on, so let me know what you would do with it. This has been Shem from RetroBreeze, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.